I've just got a handful of questions and we can, you know, kind of take this uh, wherever you want. I, I think, um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously we've worked together a long time, but uh, why invest in an in employee advocacy program? And m- maybe what would be helpful, Jed, is if you give a little bit of your history, you know, in terms of when you started investing and in how that's evolved, you know, over the years and companies. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jed Ayers. I'm the uh, current CEO globally for iGel. And uh, I've been uh, in sales and marketing for you know my entire life. Uh, 20 years, I worked in the reseller community. Um, so reselling technology for um, you know some of the largest tech resellers in the U.S., and uh, actually where I really um, I think I started using um, LinkedIn uh, aggressively in probably the 2008, 2009 time frame. I was part of this early circle of, of humans that uh, uh, believed that LinkedIn could be used more for more than just recruiting. Um, they, they had a small um, trade show they did, I think, around Sales Navigator in the early mm-hmm. days, I don't think it was called Sales Navigator back then, but it was this idea of social, socially selling and how that could work. And so, um, you know, I, I was very intrigued by it, but I believed in it. Um, and I think I how I came to learn about everyone's social was actually I was I was part of a, a marketing advisory council at HP. And um, so it was the CMO of HP bringing together other CMOs from their reseller partners. And the, the, the topic was around, you know, so social and how to use it and um, how to, how to energize your entire, uh, you know, employee base around it. And someone in the room raised their hand and, you know, sort of had heard about this small little company called everyone social. And immediately while we're in the meeting, I, I uh, you know, found the website and reached out to you all. And, you know, this was yeah over a decade ago. And you immediately responded. I don't know if it was you uh, yourself at the time. I think you were a pretty small company. It was, you know, uh, and and from there, yeah, that, that was the beginning of our relationship. I immediately signed up and um, and I and I started using it uh, with a company that had about four hundred people in it. And yeah, it was it was really interesting how how quickly people latched onto it. And loved it, right? Um, and and I, I got religion quickly that this was the way um, to to sort of harness everyone in your company. And then by uh, we also started to extend it to our part other partners. Um, and I think you were very generous early in those early days of of giving us extra licenses to sort of experiment with the ecosystem of people we worked with that didn't necessarily work inside our company. But yeah, I, I, I've been a, uh, an early believer in this technology. And I think I met you for the first time, if I remember correctly, in San Francisco in that sort of 2009, 2010 timeframe at, at an event around so, social selling. Yeah, you actually came up on stage and started telling everyone <laughs> how and why they should use everyone's social. I was given a little talk and we'd never met before and, and, uh, you popped out of your chair in the audience and, and it was awesome. Uh, what, what would you say Jed to like, um, you know, I know you've been a CMO now you're a CEO, this idea that, or, or hesitation that people have around, um, giving their employees tools to share company content, like what's, where do you think that comes from? Or, you know, why do you think it's totally bogus? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the bigger companies get, the more rules they have around, you know, branding and branding guidelines. And so there's a lot of like uh, sort of fear, I think, that companies may have about, you know, people doing things with the brand that, that don't represent it re- or don't reflect it the way they they want to. Right. So they they really try to contain it. I think that there's this other force that's, you know, um, the, the force that we use every day as consumers, right, um, to find authentic voices about techno, you know, whatever we're about to spend money on, right? Um, I don't think anyone goes out to eat anywhere or buys anything without reading reviews from real people 
uh, that are that are truly authentic, right? And I think that's what the whole benefit of of you know social sharing is is that it's through the lens and voice of an individual uh, that are carrying that that experience and that brand, right? Um, through their voice, and and everyone social sort of gives you that that platform to to sort of remind people and get that it's like get, getting them in that motion, right? And allowing them to. I think the hardest thing with everyone social is to try to make sure that everyone doesn't just hit repost, 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 right? That they bring their own uh, message into it and and they they use it um, in the way that, that that their voice comes through, right? Um, it, and we were talking before this about using uh, pictures and videos and personal personal mm -hmm. things. I personally know that you know when I share things that have pictures and have faces of real people and uh, have stories in them, those are the things that get uh, the most views, right? And then if I can port those into everyone's social and get people sharing them within the platform, then that, sh that share will do even better. And so I think that's the virtuous circle. You have to, you have to really believe in it, right? And um, you have to own it. And it, it's more than just sharing, right? It's also getting people to connect because I think that's one thing that I realize that people are remiss on, right? Your network is your net worth. And if you're not connecting with every person you come in contact with, you are missing an opportunity, right? And, and my theory is, is that if I'm somehow associating with someone on an email or a, 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 in any capacity, I send them a personalized note. It could be the assistant of a CEO that I'm having a meeting with today. But I'll send her a note and say, hey, thanks for helping me set up this meeting. And, and she's now part of my network. I, you never know where that connection will go. Totally. Yeah, no, and I know as long as we've known each other, you've been a, uh, I, 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 I personally subscribe to your approach as well. It's just kind of like, hey, if there's some sort of linkage there or opportunity, make the connection, right? Don't, don't put a lot of friction or rule. Just... Grow your network. I mean, it's it's a it's an extremely you know low cost um, uh, thing to do. One of the things that we've seen um, across everyone that we work with is when there's an executive involved, you know, not just kind of supporting it from on high, but living it and breathing it. You know, that leads to super successful programs where lots and lots of people are engaged. You're the CEO of IGEL. You've been the CMO at a few other companies where we've worked together. Um, how do you how do you encourage your people to be active in your advocacy program? What do you do to support them? I mean, I basically uh, live it, right? I, I, I guess part of what I've done is I deleted all my other, uh, you know, I only use LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and I, I just live through the lens of, of my business social platform. That's what, if I have spare time, I, I decided back in 2016 that I was going to use that spare time to learn about what's going on in my business world. And it served me very well. Right. And so I guess I just, I, I'm a believer that, uh, you know, lifelong education and you can learn from your network. Right. So if I have a spare minute, I'm opening that up and I'm connecting to the, the, the the world that I've uh, established, the network that I have, and I'm learning something. And I guess, you know, I, I just try to encourage my leadership team, right? I have eight people that report directly to me. It's not like I'm mandating that they're on LinkedIn, but they know that, um, you know, if they want to know what I'm thinking, they they can, they have access to, to, to how I'm thinking through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my, my favorite social network. Um, it, it's been very powerful through COVID also, right. To stay connected with people and to keep your name out there and, and your story out there more than any, you know, we used to have all these events physically that we would connect with people. And some of those people haven't seen in years. Right. But I know, mm -hmm. um, kind of what they're up to because of, of LinkedIn. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of other networks out there and we could talk about TikTok or, 
you know, um, the other uh, tools that the next generation is using. But for me, LinkedIn has um, served me very well. I work for a German company also, right, where there was a competing platform when I first started six years ago, which was kind of confusing because it was called Zing. I think you remember. Sure, you helped sure, yeah. us, uh, Federate into Zing because uh, I think we were really pushing for that. But, you know, it feels like uh, six years later, LinkedIn is really actually even won over the Germans. Yes. Um, so, you know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And um, to me, it's a gift because it's just your you know, uh, it's so much of, of what, what, uh, I'm working on is out there. You said, you know, you take your kind of spare moments and use that time to learn about your space and, you know, presumably share some of what you're doing or thinking or working on, on social. Do you, do you have a particular routine in terms of, uh, what you post when you post it? Um, you know, just again, kind of for you personally. I really don't, honestly. It's uh, I, I'm a pretty prolific poster, but I do it based on sort of the inspiration of the moment, right? It's like when I find something that I feel like, hey, this rises to the level of something that I I feel like others would benefit from, that are that are you know um, beyond just this four corners of of the IGEL universe. I I, I send it, but. Um, you know, I, I, um, I don't have a, oh, I wake up every day and at eight o'clock I post something, right? I, I really wait for inspiration to strike, uh, to, before I, I, I post something. And I think what it has you, to be that yeah. way. It has to be, there's this emotional component to it, right? It has to be something that's authentic. Um, otherwise, yeah, you're just a robot and I think people tune you out. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, what would you say to an executive, maybe another CMO or even a, a CEO, you know, who doesn't take social serious personally or, uh, or is something that, you know, they should be encouraging their people to use at work? Yeah, I mean, I think you just got to get religion in the world that we're living in today, right, where people are working anywhere at any time of day. And, you know, the cost of acquiring new customers is so high, right? And it's so hard. I think that's one thing we all learned through COVID is that new customers are hard, right? It was easier to sell to existing customers, but getting new ones is very hard, right? And so, you know, why wouldn't you uh, harness the power of, you know, your employee base and, and getting them, you know, really sort of encouraging them and feeding them? uh, things that could help you grow your business and also retain and grow, grow great employees. Right. It's like, it's a whole brand branding opportunity that you have at your fingertips. Right. Um, honestly, it's an, it's one of the greatest HR tools there is too, right. Because it's, you can't have a town hall every day or send an email every day or expect people to read every press release that you release out there. So social becomes kind of this great organic way to uh, consolidate a lot of different information ab about your company from all corners of the world. Um, so, yeah, I think and I guess I would also just say if you're a CMO and you're not embracing social, it's your own brand, too. Right. Like th this as a CMO, you need to curate your own voice, your own brand and ultimately you need to grow your company. Because that's the measurement of any great CMO, right? Are you building a company that's moving up and to the right? And and I think social is, I mean, look no farther than the next generation. That's how they, they're glued to yeah. their phones and they're on social. So it's coming. So <laughs> along that thread, you know, where would iGel be or what would it look like if, you and your team weren't regularly investing in social. What do you think the state of the business would be? I mean, I attribute social to um, helping take a very small unknown German company and bring it into the mainstream conversation. And in fact, one of the leading voices in end user compute today in the United States, right? Our US business is now on par with our European business. They're, they're equal in size. And we did that in a very short amount of time. And we entered into the psyches of big companies like Microsoft and VMware and Citrix 
Um, and I, I attribute social as a big part of that, right? And and everyone social is that conduit that like really aligns everybody and builds a culture of of sharing. So honestly, uh, I, I I I you know it's very rare that you hear of a germ a small German company, let let alone a German thin client hardware company, you know, transforming it into a Silicon Valley software company. Um, and you need a lot of things to gonna go your way for that story to to transpire. But one of them is brand and you know recognition of this of the technology and and social has been absolutely critical to 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 that um, success we've had. What um, you know, I think one of the things that continues to be a perennial question, I think it's probably a question associated with, you know, any initiative or effort, which is, you know, what is the ROI? And um, from your vantage, again, you've been a CMO and invested in an advocacy program. You've been the CEO uh, now of IGEL for a number of years. How do you think about the advocacy, uh, the ROI of an advocacy program? And kind of in your mind, because, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have someone you have to justify this to, how, how do you justify that investment? Well, I mean, obviously, you guys have done a great job of creating dashboards so we can see, all right, how many people are logging in and how many things are they sharing and what, you know, what what kind of visibility are we getting from from the uh, the sharing, which is great, right? Uh, but ultimately, like I just said, the 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 number one thing you 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 judge a a, a company and a CMO on is the, the you know, there's a thousand different metrics out there, but for me, I go, are you growing, right? And hopefully you're growing in double digits. And I, I just believe that uh, when I talk to people, Cameron, uh, and and I get messages on my phone or emails, invariably they say, I love watching your journey on LinkedIn. I, I love watching what you're up to, right? And it, it's because they see this sort of regular, uh, you know, steady story of, of of what we're up to, right? And it's not always, you know, the same robotic, uh, you know, social card, if you will, right? It's videos, it's personal stories, it's emotional things, mm -hmm. it's personal things, um, it's failures, also, right? It's successes. It can't always be. It has to be real. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I just, uh, I encourage anyone uh, who's a a leader out there to, to, to you got to have the courage to put your personality, uh, you know, on the line and do it through social. And yeah, I think if people, you know, before they interview with me, they tend, they'll, they'll go out on my LinkedIn page and they can, they can get a better sense of who I am, right. By, by reading through it. Um, same thing with customers. One thing that I will say that's challenging about LinkedIn today, Cameron, is that, you know, I get so much email. You have such a big network on, on LinkedIn. The the amount of uh, in-mail I get and, and you know, messages I'm getting on LinkedIn is uh, astounding. It's like uh, it's its own world to kind of keep up with that. I think that's one thing that I would say for anyone from LinkedIn that's listening in, right, is how do you... Uh, how do you deal with some of the people that are that are still out there just sort of, you know, brainlessly trying to uh, sell you something or send you in mail, right? Because you have to, there's so, I have customers that are like, hey, I need this or that, or have a question about something and sort of trying to feed, get through that feed. So no you don't way. miss that. <clears throat> That's one of the challenges I still have today uh, with LinkedIn. Yeah, That's interesting you bring that up because, I mean, you remember in the early days, you know, one of the selling points around in mail from kind of a, I mean, this is coming from LinkedIn was, you know, oh, the open rates are better than email because there's less clutter. And as a product feature, it's kind of an afterthought, right? It's not as sophisticated as it hasn't evolved over the years, like, you know, email has with filters and folders and all these sorts of things. And yeah, I think, I, I think your struggle with that is the same I mean, I talked with another CEO recently who just said, you know, I don't look at anything from an in-mail standpoint. It's just, you know, a complete mess. And my experience is the same as yours. It's like, I have to go in and actually like dig into that just to determine, 
you know, what's something that I should actually look at versus like all the other garbage that people are sending me. Right. It, it is a challenge, but then what, what makes it worthwhile is that you'll find, you know, you know, once a day I'll find something in there from a yes. customer partner that, you know, is, is somebody that's actually really reaching out. So that's, that's a challenge, but I guess I, I just believe in social in a way that, um, you know, especially for a company that doesn't have huge brand recognition, um, you know, the, this has always been my plight, right? I'm working for companies that are sort of a hundred to 500 million in size, sort of 300 to 600 employees, getting those employees sort of, um, really energized to, to, to live the life of social connecting with their, uh, customers, connecting with their partners, connecting with each other. You know, we also have a, a strong, you know, sales development program and, we, we do a lot of events, both virtually and physically. So, you know, I, I'll tell you, one of the greatest uh, stories I had with social was uh, a few weeks ago, we had an event in Newport. I took a selfie at the beginning of the event and was like, hey, I'm so excited to be back you know, uh, on the road again at this event. And uh, a, a guy saw that in my feed at eight o'clock in the morning. By 830, he was in the room and he was like, hey, I, I saw your post you know, on LinkedIn and, and here I am, I'm so excited that uh, you posted that. Right. And then he, he ended up, you know, having a great experience at the event and we've got a bunch of interesting things cooking with this guy. Um, and so that's the power of, of, of social, right. Is, and yeah, you just, you don't, you never know where it's going to lead you. Right. And I think that's one of the things that CMOs have to have the courage to, to take the the leap to really embrace it. Right. Because, yeah, it, 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 you you can't defend it. The ROI is 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 not like exact exact at times, right? It's 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 inexact. But I can just tell you, as someone that's lived it for the last fifteen years, you will and, and grown companies in double digits. Social is is a secret weapon if you get it right. Well, you're being modest because I know most people. You know, you'll be a new name to them, but, uh, you know, having worked with you at the various companies that you've been involved with, I think you've used everyone's social at four, if not five companies, all of which have had a positive outcome, then acquired, then, you know, it just, I, I think it um, uh, speaks to you and, and the priorities that, you know, you've defined as a leader within those organizations that you've been involved with. What yeah, um, I, mean, I will tell you the next company I go to, you're usually uh, in the first three phone calls I make, right? <laughs> well, who are the, the first uh, two, Jed? <laughs> who comes the, the, before the, us? The oh, pro probably my uh, executive admin. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at at iGel right now, I mean, and maybe there's a common thread here for you across across the last few companies. What it, it, for B two B? You know, and I think you're in a super interesting spot with this kind of you know, 100 to 500 million revenue, a few hundred employees, you know, we're climbing up to kind of that point. We've got a bunch of great clients that, that are, I, I, we love working with clients of that size because there's so much alignment, right? Like your company hasn't gotten big enough that now there's a bunch of people that maybe don't really know what's going on and, you know, this, that, or the other thing. What is that? What 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 is or what are the the biggest marketing challenges for iGel? And and do you, do you find any common threads with you know kind of previous experiences that some of those other organizations have been at? Well, I would have to say uh, the world changed obviously during COVID, right? And it was interesting for me because I was running the U.S. as the U.S. CEO of iGel and the CMO, and then on February six, two thousand twenty. I took the torch, you know, literally a flaming torch off the uh, stage from our uh, founder and took over. And of course, that was an auspicious, you know, uh, moment to take over a company in my first global CEO role, right, was navigating COVID, which started, you know, shortly thereafter. And um, the one thing I guess that's been challenging for Agile is, you know, we used to survive on physical events and there was a number of big you know, trade show events where it was perfect hunting grounds for the types of customers that you know, we would sell to. And so making the pivot into a digital world and then also being able to uh, find and uh, attract new customers, that's been our number one challenge 
in this new world order, right? And that's where I think social is even more important, right? Having uh, a clear identity, being able to, you know, capture people's attention in a very short, you know, window of time and, and you know, find the right buyer. And then on the other side, the other piece has been that, you know, we're suddenly in this insane war for talent. And, yes. you know, uh, the best, way to recruit people is within your own company right and so that's something that we've actually also started doing is you know spending time as a leadership team and as an extended leadership team leveraging our network that we've built and you know i hate to say this but some of our best employees have come from customers right where they see the value of the of the product and they absolutely the culture that we have and um and so reaching out to um you know, to our network, l- looking for people. It's it's just, yeah, I think the, the, these are the challenges we have today. It's really getting new customers and retaining and attracting the type of talent that you need to, to, to be successful. And social is right in the middle of that. Exactly. I, that's, that's the thing that, I mean, you know this from, you know, your... <laughs> In particular, I think when you're responsible as, you know, a CEO for a business and products and, you know, market segments and just how you're going to market and all these sorts of things, you know, there's, there's a desire and a need to kind of define things, right? Like who's our buyer? How are they using our product? We've got to understand, you know, what our message is, how we're going to act with these people. And that, that's been one of our challenges. It's like, well, social has kind of a variety of use cases over here. We work with the sales team over here. We work with the whole company over here. We work with the, uh, you know, recruiting kind of HR department. And I think, you know, you're touching on something that I think is really interesting is that, you know, all the things that you're doing as even just one person with an IGL, I mean, I see your stuff all the time. That's how I knew you were in, you know, South Korea and in Germany and doing all these cool things, connecting with team members and customers and so forth. All of those things also, you know, are of course visible to anyone who would consider joining iGel. And it gives them, I mean, you and I haven't talked in probably over a year. We probably haven't seen each other in person for two or three years. I have a pretty good picture as to at least, you know, through that window, kind of what you've been up to and how you've been progressing iGel and and the culture and you know, the other people who are involved. And it, you know, that is. That's why we see so many of, of, of our clients, I think, using social and everyone social for recruiting is it's not just what the company, it's not just a competitive advantage for the companies to project that. It's becoming an expectation on the part of the, the candidate, right? Like, right. I mean, you or I, right? We would never join a company if we didn't have a clear picture as to what are the values of this group? What are they doing? Um, you know, any number of kind of different dimensions. And to your point, it's got to be authentic. Right, exactly. And I think that's, that's where I think people need to realize, like, take your uh, guard down on, you know, the font size and the color and the brand book, and let people, you know, uh, express your, your brand through their lens, right? What's the worst thing that's going to (laughs) happen? Really, you have to take, uh, people come to work to do a great job, right? Is something I believe, right? They wake up, they go to work, they want to represent the company well. They want the company to succeed, right? And yeah, you you've got to let them, uh, you know, d- d- deliver their voice of of the journey that they're on inside your company. And yeah, you can give them some guidance and some posts, and your tool obviously helps uh, facilitate that. But I think one of the things you got to help people embrace it's like this this gives them some muscle memory but then it's like okay now i i can lift weights and now i can go go you know run a mile because i i uh i've got some of the muscle memory down and it's just it's energizing when you do it correctly right is how i see it it's 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 super energizing um as a as a lifelong learner you know to to sort of tap into this huge ecosystems of people that are out there that are, that are all trying to help each other is how I see it. And, you know, I saw it through COVID, right? A, a lot of people helping prop each other up. And I, I know there's a fear sometimes that LinkedIn or Twitter can become too political or too personal. Um, this is why I lean towards LinkedIn, right? Um, is that this tool is still, you know, there's still some boundaries, uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, in terms of the content that's out there. Um, yeah. I think it'll be interesting to see how it evolves with the younger generation, but 
uh, you know, just frankly, as younger, as more younger people kind of get into the workforce. But one thing we've seen, which, you know, I, I, I don't know, I think um, a lot of, I, I don't know, maybe a lot of folks in B2B just kind of don't think about it. You know, I was at Reddit and, you know, the <laughs> Reddit's the ultimate, you know, prototypical kind of consumer yeah. social base, just crazy, right? I, and, you know, you can, you don't have to be who you say you are, you know, it's just anything, anything goes to a degree. Um, I would sum up, you know, LinkedIn and we used to get this question and I still get it today, which just boggles my mind, but kind of to your, it was the flip side of what you just said is someone else saying, well, what if someone posts something they shouldn't? What if, you know, what if they post something bad? And, you know, I, over 10 plus years, we've never seen that happen, at least with the companies that we work with. And I think the reason is very simple is to your point, people want to go to work and they want to achieve. Everything is tied up in that, right? They, they want to improve. They want to learn. They want to get to those new heights. They want to provide and support for their family, you know, all these things. And, and they don't want to appear like an idiot in front of their coworkers, right? Like there's a, there's a natural check Definitely. and balance around doing something wrong. Um, and, and I guess the other thing about that is like, all right, even if someone posts something out there and it, it's not exactly what you want, it's a teachable moment. Right. And it's not the end yeah. of the world. Right. People think like, oh, wow, everyone in the world saw that. Like, well, the reality is that's not the case, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I like to your point, I've never seen anything that, you know, the, the, the probably the worst thing that's ever happened is maybe somebody who had something. Yeah, before release something kind of a uh, nod to you know yeah, uh, yeah. A, a product that was going to be released or something that was sort of under under wraps but that's about as close as i've ever seen uh, you know anything happen and yeah i even get a bad reputation inside of my company right people will laugh about okay that picture will be up on linkedin and you know the next two minutes or whatever right um but that that's that that to me is part of the uh, equation right is is sharing is is part of the the lifestyle that you have to embrace uh, yeah so. one i wanted to ask you one uh question on something you said a minute ago in person events were you know big for igel pre pandemic you know i think a, a lot of for a lot of companies be it reality or you know perception uh, physical events were important. Do you feel, you know, there's this big change, uh, you know, everything was remote and digital for an extended period of time. Where do you think things are going to be in the next few years? Are we going back to any of this stuff? Is it like, how is it different? I mean, I think that uh, it has to be a, a mix, right? We, we went back and uh, we're doing a 22 city roadshow right now. And I can tell you that people are, very thankful uh, in, in a way that I, I've never experienced before for IGEL hosting these kind of uh, first mover advantage events that we've had. Right. And they're, they're so thirsty to, 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 to be with each other and do some of the things that you just can't do over zoom. Right. And so I think that we've, we've got a healthier uh, appreciation for j just how good it can be when you have the in-person face-to-face mm -hmm. uh, events. And of course, you know, those events are still totally, uh, you know, subject to all kinds of crazy things that can happen. I just had an executive leadership team two weeks ago in San Francisco. We, we, we tested people when they came in the front door, two of the, of the nine people tested positive for COVID. So they had to mm -hmm. take, you know, the week, uh, event that we had planned, they had to take it from a hotel room a block away. Right. And so I think, this is part of the new reality that we have to, you know, uh, and I know this word's overused, but it's sort of hybrid is the, is the future, right? We have to find a way to, uh, you know, accommodate both. But I think one thing I will say for sure, Cameron, is that people are going to probably have, at least in the short run, they have a lot more appreciation for the sitting down and breaking bread with someone and, and being face to face, because I guess as much as I'm a believer in social, I'm also a believer that, you know, great things are done uh, uh, when you're shoulder to shoulder and you have more of an organic uh, exchange and that energy that comes with looking at people and building trust, uh, and, and, you know, that can only come with, you know, unfortunately it's breaking bread, right? It's like having a meal and sharing a beer, which is so hard to do over Zoom. I know we tried to do it at the beginning, right? We had these yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, things and 
we tried to have happy hours with our friends and our colleagues. But uh, yeah, I, I think that we're headed to a world that has an appreciation for the fact that, hey, we're looking for talent wherever it is. We're, 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 we're going to uh, be more uh, judicious about when we actually have y- things that rise to the occasion where you need to be face to face. Yeah, I'm with you. We're excited to get back out there. We've got, uh, we're trying to see at least 15 of our top clients between now and the end of the year. We want to get back to doing some small in-person events. I think similar to what you guys are doing, we probably won't get that in order until next year, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not mutually exclusive, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, all of these things can kind of work effectively together. I think it was just, it was exciting and, you know, obviously there's a lot of negative over the last few years, but it was exciting to see how much it forced so many people in organizations, you know, forward to really take things serious that are good for them and good for the company and kind of, you know, good, good for for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Good for the planet. I mean, this is the whole idea better outcomes for, for families, for companies, for the planet. Yes. I mean, I think we're also in a, a you know very 1.0 kind of version of this collaboration technology, right? I think you're mm-hmm. you know, arms race of innovation, you know, uh, between Teams and Zoom and WebEx. And I know there's going to be startups that will have things, right? And so, you know, I think this world of, uh, you know, kind of hybrid and how, how people can interact um, is only going to get better in a virtual setting. And and that yeah, probably I, say that sort of you know is another reason to be investing in social and staying on the on the front end of this curve, is you 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 want to um, you know be able to be there to be able to meet your customers and your future employees. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I think I think it's kind of one across the board. You know, even with social. I mean, I know LinkedIn is important to all of us and all of our clients and so forth, but um you know what does it look like in five years ten years i think it's going to look very different different. um just one final question jed what do you think is going to separate you know really kind of the in in the world of b2b you know you and you and us uh operate in in highly competitive spaces that's just the nature of you know high growth tech um what do you think is going to separate kind of marketing winners versus losers? You know, those that are able to put up kind of that double digit plus growth uh, versus those who can't. Well, I mean, obviously it helps to have a great product, right? Uh, and, and that's meeting a need of a, of a, uh, a, 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 of a large growing market, right? Um, but I think one of the things from a marketing perspective is you have such a small you know, moment to get people's attention, right? And build the trust. It, it and it gets shorter, it feels like, you know, over time, right? People are so bombarded with so much, so many different things from so many different places, right? And so I, I think what set is going to separate people is people that have that are that are bold and creative, risk takers, and have that have the ability to capture people's you know, uh, attention with their product, right. Um, and, and helping them sort of connect those dots, like very efficiently. Um, and, and that's hard to do, right. It's really hard to do, but social certainly is, a an important weapon in that, um, you know, that, that battle to, to find that eyeball, that's the right one for, that's going to buy your product. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, I, 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 as a marketer, always believed, and, and maybe this is part of the the sort of challenge everything rebel in, in me that you know is is you have to be bold, right? Especially in tech, right? So much of tech is the same, you know, stock art and same colors and the same boring uh, sort of uh, uh, stuff. And so that's been my strategy: is like, don't be afraid. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Get out there and and you think about some of the most successful, you know, uh, technical marketing campaigns. Right. They're, they were risk. Go back and look at Steve Jobs you know, 1984 commercial or even think about like what we're using right now is Zoom. Right. What everybody knows that they they came up with something, you know, oh, web conferencing that doesn't suck. It's like, OK that that's what we need some of that right especially at the time we were all suffering through drop calls and 
poor video quality and it was like okay they were they were they had enough conviction to to make a statement like that right and then to get it out to the world so yeah I, i'm for risk i guess in, in marketing it's one of the things that uh is a gift that i look back at in my years of marketing right where you're like yeah you get to take risks and guess what no one's dying right it's not like you're doing <laughs> surgery on someone's heart you, you have yeah. this sort of uh benefit of of doing things create you be creative and 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 do bold things and don't yeah. be afraid I, I love that and i mean you're in a different kind of space now being ceo but i know you know this you know most cmos of of organizations of any size they're only there for like two years or something on average um i mean if you're going to be anywhere for such a limited period of time how could you not take risks you have such a limited window in which to make an impact um yeah exactly but uh well thanks man it's great to see you i appreciate yeah. you making time really nice to see you i'm glad uh, that your company is doing so well and uh yeah hopefully we'll see each other somewhere in this world don't be a stranger uh if you get to san francisco yeah we're actually i was just talking with uh one of our guys yesterday we're going to be out there sometime in the fall we we're gonna go and um get together in person with the team that we're working with at apple so we're gonna we're gonna try to do a bunch of other things out there probably go see the meta team and and some other clients but uh i'll shoot you a line if you're in town it'd be wonderful yeah, I'd love to I, would, uh, lunch or something. I, I would relish uh, a chance to see you face to face and uh yeah we we have an office ironically uh my uh i'm on the corner of second and howard so my office looks at the LinkedIn bill there. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Social at Scale podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please be sure to subscribe. If you didn't enjoy it, please let me know. You can access past episodes on our site at everyonesocial.com slash podcast. As always, please feel free to connect with me directly on Twitter or LinkedIn and look forward to seeing you next time.